Okay, fine. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited over here. Um, so I want to give a talk that it's, it's actually in a, a fairly classical and abstract part of ergodic theory. So it's not so centrally connected, I know, to the themes of the special year. But I want to present a story in this part of ergodic theory that really boils down to questions about finite probability spaces or probability measures on finite metric spaces, which I hope will be of broader, broader interest and attraction. So I think my plan is to spend um, probably the bulk of the talk, certainly a good part at the beginning of the talk, just giving a, a history and a, um, a sketch overview of the area of some of these ideas presented in a biased way to put you in the right frame of mind for what comes later. And then at the end, I'll talk about a more recent classification problem where you can get a solution using this philosophy. So the first half will be about warming up to a certain philosophy, and then I'm going to try and persuade you that there are things you can do with it. So the setting here, and I should apologize if there are people who've heard all of this before. That might go on for a little while. The setting here is just the usual setting for ergodic theory. So I consider triples x mu t, where x and mu is a probability space. And t is a map from x to itself, which is measurable and mu preserving. And I'm going to say it's invertible as well. Uh, there are standard ways you can get rid of that assumption, but it's somehow not interesting for this talk, so we'll just assume that x is invertible. And um, if you're technically minded, then it will also matter that it's not a pathological probability space. It's what's called standard Borel, but that includes all the examples you're ever likely to meet. So don't worry about that assumption. OK. So let me just remind you of two of the most standard examples. Firstly, you can let x and mu be the circle group. That's r mod the integers with par measure. And then you can let t be the rotation by some fixed element alpha in the circle group. That's called a circle rotation. On the other hand, you can get a very different example by fixing a priori some finite probability space, so a finite set and a probability distribution on it. And then letting x mu be the set of all bi-infinite strings of elements of A, where the different entries of a string are chosen iid from p. So mu is the product measure. And finally, s is just the leftward shift. So you shift all the coordinates over by 1. And that's something called a Bernoulli shift. And the system that you get depends on the choice of a and p. So I will write this b of a p. And that's another large, famous family of examples. So after von Neumann and Birkhoff proved their original ergodic theorems around 1930, it quickly became apparent that these things are worth studying. The class of these things worth studying is worth studying in the abstract. And so the next thing that it was natural to do was decide what you mean by a morphism between them or a map between them and then seek some kind of classification. So the maps that we talk about here are what are called factor maps. So given two of these systems, x mu t, y mu s. A factor map pi from the first to the second is a map not necessarily defined on the whole of x, but defined on a full measure subset of x, and taking values in a full measure subset of y, where these subsets are invariant under the dynamics. and such that pi pushes the measure upstairs to the measure downstairs and converts the dynamics upstairs to the dynamics downstairs. And because in ergodic theory, we're usually interested in probabilistic properties or statistical properties, it doesn't matter that you allow yourself to throw away a negligible set at the beginning. But you do that in case, for example, x has one periodic point that carries no mass, but y has no periodic points. Then if you don't throw the periodic point away, you can't construct an equivariant map between them. So we allow ourselves to throw away these little pieces that don't show up in probability. Okay, and having said that, an isomorphism is just an invertible one of these guys. Invertible factor map. Okay. Let me go vertically rather than horizontally. 
Yes, yes, exactly. Right. And pi has to be measurable. I guess I didn't write that, but obviously pi has to be measurable. Not necessarily continuous or anything. This is just the measurable category. Right, so the classification problem, which people formulated and started thinking about almost immediately upon the appearance of the ergodic theorem, suppose it as a question, asks, can you find, or can you classify up to isomorphism using nice invariance? Where I'm not being precise about what I mean by nice. But nevertheless, it is possible, actually, to give a very sensible meaning to the word nice here, and we know now that the answer is no. So that's the bad news. So just to tell you, maybe without writing anything, what that means, it, what it, the way people interpret this is to say if you fix the probability space, so fix the unit interval, and look at all transformations from it to itself that preserve the vague measure, then if you can do this, you should be able to classify the conjugacy classes in the group of those transformations from the interval to itself. And that group carries a natural, complete, separable, metrizable topology. So it's a topological group. And it's known that you cannot single out those conjugacy classes using Borel functions on that group. So using sensible, measurable functions on that group. There's actually a theorem in descriptive set theory. So for that really very generous notion of nice invariance, this problem doesn't have a solution. But it's also true that many of the most important developments in ergodic theory since the 1930s have been around the study of partial invariance. So many partial invariants are interesting. Okay, so for example, you might ask whether this circle rotation could be isomorphic to a Bernoulli shift. They superficially look totally different, but that's not a proof that they're not isomorphic. So the first invariance that people cooked up, well, the very first invariant that people cooked up is something called ergodicity, which I assume many of you know what it means. At this point, I'm going to assume that all my systems are ergodic. What that means is that there does not exist a decomposition of the space X into two disjoint positive measure pieces. which are left invariant by the dynamics. So this is some kind of indecomposability assumption. And the point here is that if your system is not ergodic, then there is always a way to break it into ergodic pieces. This is called the ergodic decomposition. So you can always reduce to this case. But now if we return to these two examples, it's a theorem, it's actually a consequence of Weyl's equidistribution, that this is ergodic if alpha is irrational, and these guys are always ergodic. So supposing alpha is irrational, you can ask, are these isomorphic to each other? And the answer is no. And the easiest way to see that is through what are called spectral invariants, which I will mention very quickly because they're not really the point of this talk. So given your transformation T on a probability space, you can associate to it an operator UT, which is the operator of composition by T. And this is now a unitary operator on L2 of mu, say on L2 complex of mu. And it's easy to check that if you have two isomorphic systems, then the resulting unitary operators are also isomorphic. And so the spectral type of this guy is an invariant of the system. So one thing you can do is go ahead and compute the spectra of these guys. And now for circle rotations, The spectrum is actually discrete, so the spectrum is, and it's supported on the set e to the 2 pi i times multiples of the alpha that you rotate by. Whereas for Bernoulli, it's always the base. And to be more precise, it's the base with infinite multiplicity always. So it's uh, this shift on a Bernoulli space is always isomorphic to an infinite direct sum of just the multiplication operator on L2 of part measure on the unit circle. Does that make sense? So that tells this guy from this guy. What it does not do is distinguish these guys from each other. Because for different choices of A and P, you always get the same spectrum. So now the question is, when is 
BAP isomorphic to B BQ. And just for my orientation, can I ask, how many people know the answer to this question? Okay, so many don't. That's great. Good. So the spectrum doesn't distinguish these apart, distinguish these from each other. And what was needed was a new invariant. So basically no cases of this were resolved for almost 30 years until the late 50s when Kolmogorov and Sinai introduced the entropy of an abstract probability deserving system. And it turns out that that gives you a relevant invariant. So this is the theorem of Kolmogorov and Sinai. I think from 58. I'm not sure enough. I'm not confident enough to write that down. That this occurs only if the Shannon entropy of P is equal to the Shannon entropy of Q. So the Shannon entropy is this number from information theory given by this formula. Like so. so in particular, up until the proof of this theorem, it was not known whether just the uniform measure on strings on an alphabet of size 2 was isomorphic to the uniform measure on strings on an alphabet of size 3. But once you have this, you can tell them apart because one has entropy log 2 and one has entropy log 3. So that gave a necessary condition for isomorphism. He did the other direction. Onsen is the other direction. So Komogorov and Sinai proved this, and then Ornstein proved that. Okay, so That's the other direction. Yeah. I will, I'll come back to that briefly a bit later on. <laughs> this is the easier direction, but I want to sort of show you what's going on here. So this h of p, this is just some number that de depends on the finite probability distribution p. And when you first look at this, if you worked with entropy before, it's clearly somehow relevant. But to actually prove a theorem like this, what you have to do is to find an abstract invariant for an arbitrary probability preserving system, which is show that it's genuinely an isomorphism invariant, and then prove that for a Bernoulli shift, it equals this number. So what I want to do now is give you an introduction to this abstract Komogorov Sinai entropy, which is not the completely standard introduction, but starts to introduce this philosophy that I'm selling, and then at least give you a sketch of why it's isomorphism invariant, and then the fact that it comes, comes down to this for a Bernoulli shift is just a calculation. Okay, so this is an introduction to Komogorov Sinai entropy. So again, I'm going to assume throughout that my system is ergodic. I can always make that reduction a priori. And I'm going to have this discussion only for systems where the space is like a to the z, or something to the z, and the transformation is the shift, but I allow any invariant measure. So I'm restricting to that class, but that's still actually an, an enormous class. If you take my word for it, you can code up pretty much anybody as one of those. So consider shift systems. a to the z, some invariant measure, and then s is the shift. So I'm going to introduce the invariants of these guys. Okay. Having done that, what I can now do is for each n, I can look at the marginal distribution of mu on strings of length n, say coordinates 1 up to n. That's now a probability measure on a finite set. And now the entropy will be some quantity that characterizes this. So the formula that you probably have very likely seen before is that the entropy of mu is the limit of the normalized entropies of the mu n's. So that's very standard. I want you to forget that for now. Well, don't forget it, but don't focus on it. What I'm going to do is state a theorem that actually tells you what this entropy means geometrically. OK? So we've already introduced the idea that we need to look at these measures on finite sets. But the discussion is much more instructive if you remember a little bit more information. So what I'm going to consider is the finite metric probability spaces where the space is a to the n, and the measure is mu sub n, and the metric is the Hamming metric. So the Hamming metric. It's just a metric on strings of length n that counts the fraction of coordinates where they differ. OK, so this is a sequence of finite sets with metrics and probability distributions on them. And now the theorem, which 
I don't know that it has a name, but it follows from what's called the Shannon Macmillan theorem, is the following. Let me write this down. Actually, I think this one is due to Jack Feldman. I should say this is a long history, which means there's a lot of relevant names, and I will probably forget many of them. I think this is due to Jack Feldman. Is the following. For any epsilon between 0 and 1, and for delta positive, I'm going to write something and then tell you what it means. So what I've written here, this is some quantity. What is this? This is what I call the 1 minus epsilon covering number of my metric probability space. And it's the number of delta balls that you need to cover 1 minus epsilon of the measure. Okay, so it's the smallest cardinality of a set of centers F, such that the delta neighborhood of that set of centers has measure at least 1 minus epsilon. So it's a covering number where you're allowed to miss a small part of the space as measured by mu. What this theorem says is that if you look at this sequence of metric probability spaces, and you fix this error tolerance epsilon, the size of the piece you're allowed to omit, then these covering numbers go like e to the hn, where h is the entropy, minus something times n plus little o of n. And the something here is bounded and goes to 0 as delta goes to 0. So if you pick delta very small, then these co approximate covering numbers grow at an exponential rate that is roughly given by h times n. Okay? And that, that tells you h uniquely. Uh, it, well, I'm... Okay, so inside the proof of the theorem, you need to know that mu n is the marginal of a shift invariant measure. It's not true for any measure on a to the z. For an arbitrary sequence measure on a to the z, there doesn't have to be a well-defined asymptotic rate at all. Yeah, yeah, so the dynamics is in the proof that that number plays this role. And this is really, this is a fairly straightforward consequence of the Shannon-McMillan theorem, and that in turn uses the subadditivity of these numbers h of mu n, and that comes from the shift invariant. DH is this Hamming metric. So this, thi this thing here. So for any metric probability space, metric space of the probability measure. D is, D is a metric, yeah. So this is a definition of the approximate covering number. And then I apply it to those spaces. And those numbers grow, and the rate at which they grow tells me h. Okay? okay. So that's a theorem that somehow tells you what the entropy means. Once you're looking at small enough radii, the entropy is the exponential growth rate of these covering numbers. So now what I can do is give you a quick sketch of why they give you an isomorphism invariant. So actually more is true. They're not just isomorphism invariant, they're actually monotone. So if you have a factor map from one shift system to another, then h of the first guy must be at least h of the second guy. So in particular, if they're isomorphic, they have the same entropy. Okay? So what, what I want to do for you now is sketch the proof of this theorem, which is fairly easy once we have this theorem, once we have this interpretation of h as a rate of growth of covering numbers. So first, let's say what makes this difficult. So a map pi 
of this kind, you can always write as a collection of coordinate maps, where pi sub n gives you the nth output bit here. And then the shift invariance tells you that pi sub n is just pi sub 0 composed with s to the n. Because pi has to convert s to s, s is shifting the n's. If you write out what that means coordinate-wise, it's this. So once you know pi 0, you know the whole thing. On the other hand, if somebody gives you any map to the finite set b, pi 0, you can reconstruct a whole pi that it came from. So you actually have a bijection between factor maps or equivariant maps from a to the z to b to the z and just maps from a to the z to b. And I'm quietly ignoring the fact that you're allowed to pass to full measure subsets in this case, which is not actually a serious problem for what I just said. Okay. And so what makes this difficult is now looking at this map pi naught. That's a measurable map to a finite set. So it's really just a partition of a to the z into measurable pieces. But those pieces can depend on all the infinitely many coordinates in some very complicated way. It's certainly not just a map from a to b. It's much more complicated than that. So what we need really is some way of approximating pi 0 or pi by a map between finite sets so that I can start comparing these covering numbers. And so the key fact, which is just a result from measure theory, is that if you have any finite partition of a measure space a to the z for any measure, you can approximate it by a partition that depends on only finitely many coordinates. So for any epsilon positive, there is some L. Uh, so there's an L and a map psi 0 from a to the finite interval from minus L to L, so just finite strings with, uh, in the alphabet A. Such that under the measure mu, pi naught applied to a string A very likely agrees with psi naught applied to its restriction to these coordinates. So you can approximate pi naught in this sense by a map depending on finitely many coordinates. Okay? So that's very straightforward. So now what am I going to do? I'm going to consider some n, and let's take it enormously larger than L. And now I'm going to consider the sequence pi 1n. So that's the sequence of maps pi 1 up to pi n. These are maps from a to the z to b to the n. And similarly, psi 1n, well, I'll write that down. So psi 1n is the map from strings with values in A indexed by minus L to n plus L, which at each coordinate just look at that window of size L on each side around the coordinate and apply psi. Does that make sense? Is it clear what this means? Minus L, yeah, minus L and plus L. Okay? And now this fact, yeah, let me stay here, tells you that once you're looking at these very long strings, most of the time it happens that most coordinates agree. That's just Chebyshev's inequality. So let me write that in terms of the Hamming metric. Less than, and I think you get a root epsilon and a 1 minus root epsilon, probably. So typically, when you input a string and apply pi 1n to it, what you get is close in this Hamming metric to applying this block mess finite map to it. Okay? But now, because pi was well, a factor map from mu to nu, the law of this guy equals nu sub n. That's the thing whose approximate covering number I want to estimate. And this distribution is very close to the distribution of this guy, because here is a coupling under which they are usually very close in the Hamming metric. So formally, if you know about transportation costs or Wasserstein metric, this is an approximation to nu n in the Wasserstein metric. 
So let me just write this a little bit fuzzily now. What we've obtained is that nu n is approximately this map psi 1 n applied to mu minus L to n plus L. Okay? On the other hand, this map psi 1 n, where was it? It was here. What does it do? It, for each output bit, it simply computes what it should be using psi applied to an input window of size roughly 2L. Turning that around, it means that each input bit can influence only 2L output bits. So if you change one bit here, you change at most 2L or 2L plus one bits here. And that's telling you this map is 2L Lipschitz for the Hamming metric. So this is 2L Lipschitz. So this, yeah, I'm being a bit fuzzy about what this means, but what it actually means is this. So this first coordinate has law nu n, because nu is this factor map. And the second coordinate has law given by the right-hand side. And this gives you a coupling of those two measures under which those two points are usually very close together. Yeah, so, okay, what if instead we looked at the integral of dh of all this stuff, d mu, right? This is an average from 1 to n of the probability that these two strings differ in the nth coordinate. And that's just an average of this number, or 1 minus this number, which is small. So the integral of dh is small. So by Markov's inequality, it's usually small. So I'm taking, I, t I have a finite coordinate approximation for this one map pi zero, and then I turn it into a, a Hamming metric approximation for a big block. That's all. Okay. But now what you can check, and this is an exercise, it's easy and I won't go into it, is if you have this kind of approximation for two measures on the same, same metric space, and if the distance here is smaller than the radius delta you care about, then they have roughly the same covering number. So this implies that say delta is at most, and I think what well, I have a root epsilon in here. I probably shouldn't have used epsilon for that. That was a mistake. So it's not the same as the one minus epsilon. Let me backtrack and call that eta. So then, this is controlled by the same thing, where instead, the measure I use is this image measure. And I lose a little bit in the radius. Okay? But now, if you apply a Lipschitz map, the covering number of the output at radius delta is bounded by the covering number of the input at radius delta over the Lipschitz function. Because you pull back a ball and you get a ball you get something contained in the ball. So this is now a to the minus l n plus l dh and mu minus l n plus l. And then here I get delta minus eta over 2l. Give or take a 1 somewhere. But now n was enormously larger than l. So to leading order, this thing is behaving like e to the entropy times n. And since I could take delta as small as I want and then choose eta even smaller, sending delta to zero gives me the result. So sending Does that make sense? So it's really uh, just the geometry of these spaces that's responsible for this. The fact that you can approximate the factor map by a map between finite spaces, which is a Lipschitz with some fixed Lipschitz constant. Did I? No, that's used here. That's inside this theorem. Not in this argument, no. No, no. 
Um, I, I, I understand the interplay of the, uh, the, 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 the two uh, supermass orbits mm-hmm. that are isomorphic, but um, you can, you know, in quantum mechanics, you have a relative density of states. Mm-hmm. So you, get, you go to a box here, and then you talk to it, and you have a state that goes, you know, and, and it's an energy wave. So you, you, know, you can have a class, you know, you can have two oscillators that go at di- different density of states. R- yes. Okay. But that's yeah. I don't know how to I don't know how to suggest um, a way of doing that here because, as I understand it, int- the integrated density of states is also depends on, as you say, more than just the unitary equivalence class of the operator. Right. But you're choosing you're somehow but choosing but more here to begin with. Oh, I see. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know of anything like this. I don't know how to find because what you'd need is an isomorphism in where invariant way of attaching your Laplacian or whatever it is to the probability preserving system. Yeah, if it's just some right, 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 right. But, but you still have some notion. Yeah. So uh, once you've once you've decided to work with finite boxes, the best you can do for your two different systems is this kind of approximation, um, approximation of the factor map by a block map in probability. I don't know how you would attach yeah, an I operator. Just, yeah. Maybe. I, I'm not aware of anything. I mean, I'm not going to say never, but I don't know. Yeah, OK. Right, so that's a very quick proof that this thing is monotone. Of course, I've hidden the hard work in the fact that these covering numbers behave the way I said they do. But this is also a standard fact follows from the Shannon that nobody cares. If you want, you can just forget the definition of entropy and use this as the definition of entropy. And that will give you a shorter proof. You then have to work a little bit to show that for Bernoulli shifts, this number is the Shannon entropy of a one-dimensional distribution. But that's actually not terribly hard. You know, people who work in coding or information can do that in half a page pretty easily. OK. So that's, that's a very quick account of entropy theory. I'm telling you this partly to emphasize this point of view that looking at the asymptotic behavior of these finite metric probability spaces tells you a lot about how the system is behaving. So what I want to do now is show you other ways in which geometric features of those spaces control the system. And very quickly, because I, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but the next obvious way in which that's true is um, relates to Ornstein's theorem. So Ornstein's theorem, which is quite a lot harder than the kolmogorov sinai theorem, asserts that equality of those Shannon entropies also implies isomorphism. So Ornstein's theorem. So I won't say much about the proof of this, but I should tell you that at the heart of this proof is not really a direct argument about Bernoulli shifts. There is at this point a proof of this theorem that just is some by hands construction of an isomorphism between Bernoulli shifts due to Keenan's Morodinsky. But Ornstein's proof doesn't do that. Instead, it introduces a very general necessary and sufficient condition for an arbitrary shift invariant system to be isomorphic to a Bernoulli shift. So the heart of this, let me go over here, is necessary and sufficient conditions for some arbitrary shift invariant system, shift invariant measure on a to the z, to be isomorphic to a Bernoulli shift of the same entropy. So when the entropy rate on the left equals the Shannon entropy on the right. And actually, at this point in, in the story, there's not just one, but several necessary and sufficient conditions that are known. And I want to tell you again the, the geometric one. So I'm going to state it and then explain a little bit what it means. So this holds if and only if these spaces A to the N with the Hamming metric and the marginal measures exhibit ex- almost exponential concentration of measure. you what that means. But I'm guessing many people here know what concentration of measure means, one sense or another. Yeah, so abstractly, if you have a sequence of metric probability spaces, 
there are lots of equivalent definitions of concentration of measure. So let's suppose now that we just have any sequence of metric probability spaces. Then concentration of measure, you can think of as a condition about Lipschitz functions on these spaces and asserting that arbitrary Lipschitz functions have to concentrate near their mean value. So if you look at a SUP of all real valued Lipschitz functions on Xn of the probability under the mu n that f is far from its mean, say bigger than delta, this has to go to zero for any delta. So that's concentration of measure. That's one of the many equivalent definitions of concentration of measure. So this is, this is quite weak, and we're going to strengthen it. So exponential concentration of measure, for me, so for this talk, means that for every positive delta, there's an exponential rate here. For some positive c. So these errors go to zero exponentially fast. I haven't told you how c depends on delta, just that for every delta there is a positive c. So when you actually prove these things in practice, usually you get some, very often you get c is something like delta squared. But I'm not going to go into what the dependence is. So almost exponential concentration of measure is something between these two. So let me write that down over here. This says that there are subsets xn prime in xn of measure tending to 1, such that if you restrict to the xn primes, then you see exponential concentration of measure. So because the xn primes are filling up the whole space, this implies concentration but it is weaker than exponential concentration. It says there's a, some small part of the space where the concentration could be happening slower, but once you remove that, then you see exponential concentration. And so the heart, at least as I've presented it, of Ornstein's theorem is the fact that an arbitrary shift in variant measure is isomorphic to a Bernoulli shift if and only if these marginal metric spaces have that property. So this is very nice. It's a really a geometric phenomenon. Uh, not in this language. Uh, I think probably the first person to know something really close to this is Jean-Paul Thouvenot around 1980. Um, Ornstein had these other conditions like very weak Bernoulli and finite determination and so on, which are not too far from this if you know that this is what you're shooting for. But it's true that he didn't have the language of concentration of measure. But if, you know, by, by, by the mid-90s, this has already appeared in Paul Shields' textbook. It's somehow not widely known outside of Gothic theory. <laughs> okay. So again, the geometry of these spaces is controlling some ergodic theoretic property of the system. And also, I can now tell you very quickly, maybe I won't write anything down, you can at least see the necessity of this condition very similarly to how we prove monotonicity of entropy. And that's because if your system is Bernoulli, let me write it over here, then these metric probability spaces are again A to the N, Hamming metric, and a product measure, or I guess it's B and Q now. And for these, concentration of measure is very classical. This is one of the oldest examples known for the exponential concentration of measure. And this argument I showed you before tells you that if you have a factor map from Bernoulli onto this unknown shift system, then there is approximately a Lipschitz function from this marginal space, maybe with n becomes n plus 2l, to this marginal space, mu n. And looking at the definition over there, it's very clear that if you have a sequence of metric probability spaces which exhibit exponential concentration and Lipschitz images of them with a fixed Lipschitz constant, those images will also exhibit exponential concentration just because the real value test function downstairs can be lifted to a test function upstairs. So once you have the idea to ask about concentration of measure, it's very easy to prove that this is a necessary condition, and then the miracle is that it's also sufficient. Okay. So having said all that, are there questions at this point? <laughs> 
Okay, having said all that, what I want to do now is move on to some more recent material. And this is around a certain family of examples which were first analyzed using this machinery, but about which some questions remained open. So the ergodic theoretic question behind what I'm about to discuss now is the existence of systems which are what are called k-automorphisms, but are not Bernoulli shifts. So again, let's just stay within the world of shift systems. Da, 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 mu s. Then, so say this is a k-automorphism, a Kolmogorov automorphism, just means that its past tail sigma algebra is trivial. That's all. It's a trivial past tail. So if you know the distant past, the distant past history of your process, you basically know nothing about the present. Is everyone happy with that definition? Okay. So examples are anything isomorphic to a Bernoulli shift. And what else? And that was the question that was open for a long time. So the problem with this was not um, a lack of candidate examples. There were quite a few examples out there that people could show were k-automorphisms. The problem was that people could not prove that they were not isomorphic to Bernoulli shifts. And once Ornstein introduced his criteria, then they could start to prove that. So there are others, and this is a, originally a result of Ornstein. And then Ornstein and Shields showed that there are uncountably many others and various other things. Okay. But the problem with this work if you want to be critical, is that these examples were constructed just for the purpose of being examples of this phenomenon. They're very unnatural and they're quite hard to describe. And so then it became a question of interest to find naturally occurring examples of this phenomenon. And it turns out that there are some, and these relate to random walks and random series. So now I'm going to set up this family of examples and then the old theorem will be that they are k-automorphisms and not Bernoulli, and the new theorem will be some enhancement of this. So a priori, these are not defined as shift systems, but then by some coding, you can turn them into shift systems. So I'll go over that in a second. But this is the one that you just said, classical that they are. Yes, so it's, it's classical that these are not Bernoulli, and then the new result is that they are also distinct from each other. Oh, but so you get a, a big family of examples. I'll come to that in a, in a moment. But first, let me set them up. Okay, so. So for, to construct these abstractly, your state space, first you choose, again, some finite probability space AP. Now your state space will be strings of plus minus ones times strings with values in A. And your measure will be the product measure. But initially, you don't define the transformation to be the regular shift. It's a skew shift. Whoops, oh, that's gone. OK, so the first coordinate just gets shifted. But then the second coordinate shifts either forward or back, depending on what the first coordinate was doing. Like so. OK, so it's a skew shift. So what does this actually mean? What this pair of strings is doing is capturing the history of a random walk together with a random scenery. So here's the picture. There's the plane. The first string will be the sequence of steps taken by a random walk, which I will draw so that it passes through the origin. And the second string is a coloring of the vertical axis by elements of this alphabet A. And they're chosen independently in IID everywhere. So that the walk is a simple random walk, and then this is an IID scenery. And then the transformation is just the shift of the time zero. So you shift time by one. The random walk moves one step into the past. That's this. But because I insist on it going through the origin, I then have to move the picture either up or down so that that still happens. And that's why I'm getting a, an addition of the step taken at time zero in here. So that's the random walk in a random scenery. Okay, I guess. Uh, 
So the dynamics, if there's this picture with the coloring and the walk, that's the state as it is now. The image of that under the dynamics will be the new state where I move the vertical axis over by one. So I said that's a time, a movement of time by one step, but I still insist on the walk passing through the origin. So it's, it's a random walk in a random scenery as seen by the walker. Yeah? Okay. So that's not a shift system, but it's very easy to turn it into one. All you do is you say you want to map from this system x mu t to some shift system. So again, the alphabet over here will be plus minus one times a to the z. I'm going to insist that the transformation be s. And at each single time, I'm just going to look at the walk and the color seen at the origin at that time. And then that tells me what the output distribution is. We call this nu. So let me just write out what the map is, and then that'll explain what I've just written down here. Given the sequence omega n and a m, the output sequence is, again, the omega n's, but then it's the string of colors that the walker sees, not the colors just in order vertically, but the colors as they are seen by the walker. So this is A of where you have to adjust this in the obvious way when n is negative. Okay, so the law of this output string, if you choose these iid, the law of this output string is not a product measure. It's something else. But this is now a shift invariant distribution. And so the first thing to know is that this is a chaotomorphism and it's not a Bernoulli shift. So I don't want to dwell on that too much, but let me just mention why that's true, maybe, in maybe without writing anything. The reason it's a chaotomorphism is that if you know the past up to a million years ago, back here somewhere, you know all the steps that the walker took before that time, and you know the scenery exactly, except that you don't know where the walker was at that time. So there's some vertical error in the location of the walker. And that means you know the scenery only up to a vertical shift, which could be of order root of a million. And so as you look further and further into the past, you're forgetting all the steps taken by the walker, and you're also losing information about the scenery because there's an uncertainty in where it was up and down. So as long as the scenery process vertically is ergodic, you eventually lose all the information. On the other hand, the reason it's intuitively not a Bernoulli shift, and I won't, I won't go over this, or maybe I'll just say this again in words, is if you look at output strings of length n, so you look at the output bits from time 1 to n, the steps taken by the walk were all independent. There's two to the n possibilities, and they were all independent. But with very high probability, you only visited about square root n of the scenery, because the walk drifts slowly. And that means that most of that space of output strings can be partitioned according to what scenery you saw, and that's a partition into sub-exponentially many pieces in n. It's actually exponential in root n. And now the hard part of the proof of non bernoullicity is to show that if you take that distribution on output strings and condition on what the scenery was, so you have different distributions for different sceneries, they're actually quite far apart in some sense for the Hamming metric. If you have two very different sceneries, then the conditional output distribution that you see from this map will be very different for the two different sceneries. What that means is that this output space can be broken into sub-exponentially many pieces that are well separated, and that precludes exponential concentration. But that was very fast. It doesn't matter if you didn't take it in too much. But again, there is a geometric reason why the fact that you don't see exponentially much of the scenery prevents exponential concentration. And so once people had studied these examples, I should also give some, so give some credit. It was known since the 70s, I think, due to... Adler, Ornstein, and Weiss, that this is a chaotomorphism, and then the proof that it's not Bernoulli is due to Calico, and this is a very famous difficult theorem. Involves several new ideas, basically about random walks and random sceneries. But having said that, the remaining question was whether these examples are isomorphic to each other. So you get a different example for every choice of A and P, and the question is, when are random walk and random scenery with A and P, and the same with B and Q isomorphic. And now the new theorem is that this holds if and only if, again, the Shannon entropies agree. So maybe in my last five minutes I can say something about why that's true. 
So firstly, this sounds like the Ornstein theorem, but there are a lot of differences that I should emphasize. Firstly, now that we have the Ornstein theorem, the implication this way is actually easy because knowing that these agree tells you that the scenery processes by themselves are isomorphic. And from that, you can easily just write down an isomorphism of the whole random walking random scenery system. So Ornstein's theorem makes that direction easy. But this direction is a bit more difficult because this quantity is certainly not the entropy of that process. Not at all. And in fact, if you look at this process of random walk and random scenery, we can work out very easily what the entropy is. Because if you look at the output strings up to time n, there's two to the n equally likely possibilities for the steps, but you only visit about root n of the scenery. So to leading exponential order in n, all the entropy just comes from the walk. So these things always have entropy log n. Uh, sorry, log two, I beg your pardon. So the Kolmogorov scenario entropy doesn't see this number. If you actually look at the growth rate of those covering numbers, you see a sub-exponential correction. You see an ex a, a correction that's of order square root n that does see this number. But sub-exponential corrections are not robust under isomorphisms. I mean, they're really not. It just doesn't, it's just not true. So to prove this, what you have to do is cook up a new abstract invariant of systems that remembers this number in the case of a random walk in a random scenery. And so now the story becomes somewhat similar to the story about entropy, that you have some information theoretic quantity that seems to capture what you want, and then you have to make it robust by looking instead at the geometry of these metric spaces. So now you think for a while, and maybe the way to introduce this, oh no, <laughs> it's just yeah, much worse. Really, really. Okay, I leave that to I leave that to some specialist. So the way the way to think about this, I think, first is to look at this picture, and ask about the following information theoretic property, rather than just looking at the amount of information, so the entropy, of the distribution on strings of length n. You look at the distribution on strings from time minus n to zero. And then also the distribution on strings from time zero to n. They are coupled together somehow. That's two different random collections of data coupled together. And ask, what is the mutual information? So the walk in the past and the walk in the future are independent. They give you no mutual information. And then the past walk down back to time minus n visits some amount of scenery. And the walk into the future visits some different piece of the scenery. And the mutual information you get from those is just the, the scenery overlap. It's that interval that they both visit in. So if you write down the sequence of these numbers, so mutual information of, and let me just write this in a godic, a godic theory language. So what is this? P minus N zero, that's just the coordinates from minus N to zero output by this coding map. And then P zero N is coordinate zero to N. And this is the mutual information shared by those two outputs. What you, what you find is that it all comes from that overlap of the two sets visited by the walk. So let's make, a ridiculous, let's make a ridiculous simplification. Let's assume that any two trajectories of the random walk actually visit a an interval of fixed size, some fixed constant times root n. Stupidly not true, but it simplifies like this. Just talk about that case. Then you'll find that this simply equals that constant times the scenery entropy times root n. So if, for a general shift invariant process, the growth rate of these numbers were an isomorphism invariant, we would be done, because you see the constant you want in here. Unfortunately, it's not. Again, this is not a robust enough number. And that's because, basically, the definition of this is, is a difference of entropies. So what is it? It's, bah, 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 bah. it's the sum of these two entropies minus the entropy of everything, which is actually 2 times that minus. minus this, that's effectively the definition of mutual information. That grows linearly with n with some sublinear correction. That grows linearly with 2n with some sublinear correction. And now this is just seeing the correction. And I've already told you the correction is not an isomorphism invariant. But having this idea of looking at the mutual information now suggests finding some geometric quantity that approximately does the same job as mutual information but is more robust. So maybe very quickly I'll finish by telling you what it is. And then the punchline is that that gives you the theorem. So the relevant structure now is not 
a sequence of probability spaces with metrics on them, but with pairs of metrics on them. So now we're going to look at the space of strings indexed by minus n to n, and with two metrics, d1 and d2, and this output distribution from minus n to n, where d1 is the Hamming metric just on the first n coordinates, and d2 is the same thing on the second n coordinates. So we call this maybe a sequence of pair metric spaces. And now for single metric spaces, we made the entropy more robust by instead looking at the number of balls you need to cover most of the measure. So here I'm going to do the same thing, but instead of looking at balls, I'll look at iterated balls for these two metrics. So now look at, let me write it here. The minimum cardinality of a set F such that the measure of the D1 delta neighborhood of the D2 delta neighborhood of F buh, 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 is at least 1 minus epsilon. And I call this the bicovering number, 1 minus epsilon of X, D1, D2, mu, delta. So you're allowed to expand under one metric, and then you're allowed to expand under the other one. You get these bi-neighborhoods, and then you ask how many of those do you need to cover the whole space. And the punchline, which I guess I'm running out of time to write down, is that modulo the correction about that overlap of intervals not actually being always of fixed size, these numbers for this system grow at the rate of some constant times root n times the scenery entropy. And because I defined them in terms of geometric properties of these metrics, another easy rerun of that previous proof gives you isomorphism invariance. So growth rate is iso invariant and sees H of P. Yes, okay, that's very, that's very good. Oh, you're very awake, that's very good, okay. So there's, uh, yeah, so I was going to say, to make this correct, there are three or four little lies I've been telling you that we need to fix. That one is important. What you actually do is this. No, no, it's not that bad. What you have to do is take this full metric probability space and allow yourself to pass to some subset of measure at least a half. So what you actually do is take a max over subsets of a to the minus n, n of measure at least a half, or some constant kappa. It's easier if you make kappa smaller. And then what you see is this. So now you have this space of pairs of strings, but I'm allowed to pass to any subset of measure one half. In that subset, it could be that the first string really does constrain what the second string can be. So looking at a, a neighborhood so just for D1, I can't, I can't fix the head of the string and make any tail I want because it may not be in the subset U. That's, so that's how you fix this problem. And U reflects what the measure mu was because the allowable mu's, the constraint is that they mustn't be too small. So if, if mu actually is a lot of memory between the past and the future, that probably means you can choose a set U that carries a lot of the measure, but where there are very high constraints from the, first, the, from the tail to the head. And so the mutual information is higher. Does anyone else see, does anyone see the other two problems? Or do I stop talking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's, the actual definition is that there's another min out the front here that you introduce to deal with this fact that, um, uh, if you put a min in the very front, then this can be a max. Another, another, another feature of this is that it sort of doesn't matter. There's more than one way of cooking this, and they will all kind of give you the same answer up to a constant for this family of examples. In general, they give you different invariants. But the other problem that you really urgently need to repair is that um, two different walks typically overlap in a, a random amount of scenery, and you need to somehow constrain how much scenery you see. And you do that by an initial min over one subset and then a max over further subsets. And you can probably do that as either a min max or a max min, and you get different numbers, but they both remember H of P, so it doesn't matter. <laughs>
uh, and then you've solved your two big problems. Yeah. But that's the idea, and I don't, I don't want to try and fix it anymore. This sort of gives you the, the flavor, so I'm going to close.